Our next speaker is Dr. Modele Ogunui, and it's my pleasure to introduce her as my colleague and friend. She is the Associate Medical Director of the Heart Failure Program at Grady Hospital. <clears throat> After receiving her medical degree, she obtained a master's in public health from Johns Hopkins University, then completed a preventive medicine and public health fellowship at the CDC. Her clinical research focuses on examining and eliminating disparities in cardiovascular disease specifically related to heart failure. Dr. Ogunui is on the advisory board for two major initiatives of the American Heart Association in Atlanta, targeting hypertension and heart failure. She serves on the leadership board for the National Hypertension Control Roundtable, a national initiative by the CDC to improve national hypertension control rates. And she is a principal investigator on several clinical trials. Dr. Ogunui is going to speak to us this morning on a very broad topic, the enrollment of women and underrepresented populations in clinical trials, the opportunities and challenges. Thank you, Dr. Sedinso, for that kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today to talk to you about enrollment of women and underrepresented populations in clinical trials, opportunities, and challenges. This subgroup population can actually take an hour. So you can divide talking about women and underrepresented minorities into separate lectures. But in the next 30 minutes, I will try to highlight the important features looking at opportunities and challenges for improving diversity in clinical trials. Here are my disclosures. So over the next 30 minutes, I hope to review the epidemiology and give you a historical perspective of the participation of women and underrepresented minorities in clinical trials. I'll describe barriers and challenges to diversity in clinical enrollment. And we'll also look at some strategies to increase enrollment of women and underrepresented minorities in cardiovascular clinical trials. It's not a surprise to this group, we all know this for a fact, that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in the United States. However, women and underrepresented minority populations are underrepresented in most cardiovascular clinic trials. Especially for underrepresented minorities, they have lower enrollment and retention rates. This group also knows that sex differences in cardiovascular disease, as well as racial and ethnic disparities in cardiovascular dis disease have been well described. Therefore, it's essential for us to have ample participation of women, as well as ethnic minorities in cardiovascular clinical trials, so we can study these differences better. I am going to give a highlight historical perspective, both of minorities as well as women. So let's talk a little bit about historical perspective about, of women participating in clinical trials. So in 1977, the FDA introduced a, gu a guidance document, and that guidance document basically excluded women of childbearing potential from research. This, this stemmed from concern about fetal exposure. The drug at the time was notably thalidomide. So as you can see, this um, guidance document says, in general, women of childbearing potential should be excluded from the LS Joe's ranging study. So they're basically talking about phase one and phase two studies, because at the time, the concern was to protect the most vulnerable population. Moving forward to 1993, the, um, what signed into law, the NIH Revitalization Act. So it became a law. And at that time, they established an outreach department, which included the Office of Research on Women's Health, as well as the Office of Research on Minority Health. And their focus was, is to provide 
outreach to encourage the inclusion of women and ethnic minorities in research. In the same year, the FDA also revised their guidelines and they put out a guidance document for inclusion of women in clinical trials as well as studying the sex differences in clinical evaluation of drugs. In 2001, the Institute of Medicine identified sex as a variable that contributes to health. So they put out this report exploring biological contributions to human health, does sex matter? NIH also amended their policy to ensure that women and ethnic minorities are included as subjects in clinical research. The, in Congress in 2014 and 2015, the Research for All Act was introduced, and this was introduced to direct the FDA to make sure that they were examining sex and sex differences in the clinical efficacy and safety of clinical drug trials. In 2016, NIH recognized predominantly sex as a bi biological variable. They came up with the acronym of four Cs. So consider, collect, characterize, and communicate. This was put out by the Office of Research in Women's Health. So what's the data of participation of women in cardiovascular drug clinical trials? This slide shows data an article published by Pamela Scott and colleagues in the Journal of American Cardiology. I'll walk you through it. So first of all, you can see the major cardiovascular conditions that we have. Defining participation to prevalence ratio, this is a ratio between the percentage of women participating in clinical trials divided by the percentage of women with the in the disease population. And a value of 0 0.8 to 1.2 represents good representation in a clinical trial. So as you can see, in cardiovascular drug clinical trials that will get approval by the FDA, conditions such as acute coronary syndrome, coronary artery disease, and heart failure women are underrepresented in those drug trials. We have an over, not surprising to say, we have an overrepresentation of drug trials that support pulmonary hypertension. And in trials, drug trials, looking at hypertension and atrial fibrillation, women, they have the same representation as in the disease population. Going to heart, um, looking at the participation of women in heart failure trials, this study was published right here from Emory. Dr. Taham was one of our former cardiology fellows, now an interventional cardiology fellow, and they examined the participation of women in heart failure trials. There was a non-significant trend of participation of women in this heart failure trials, and it, as you can see, the participation of women in these clinical trials were well under 30%. This was an interesting thing I came across as I was preparing for this talk. Um, Reza and colleagues examined the association between women authors and enrollment of female participants in heart failure trials. I was surprised to note that has the number, the percentage, has have a higher percentage of women as senior or as first authors in heart failure trials, the greater the number of female participants in heart failure trials. And this relationship stood the test of time, even after adjusting for the number of sites, number of enrollments, geographical regions. So that's something to also think about as we think about improving diversity in clinical trials. I'm going to talk about two more trials, cardiometabolic randomized clinical trials. So 
they, the authors looked at 143 drug trials supporting FDA approval of cardiometabolic drugs over a 10 year period. So the drugs that were included were 24 cardiovascular drugs and 11 drugs for diabetes. They had a median of about 6,000 patients for trial supporting each drug. And overall, we had an abysmal representation of women at 36.4%. Looking at the 10 year period, there was no significant increase over the 10 year period for participation of women in the clinical trials. And like previous trials that we have looked at, women were more likely to be enrolled in drug trials for pulmonary hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes. I already defined the prevalence to participation ratio. So a ratio of 0 0.8 to 1.2 represents adequate representation. But as you can see, women are underrepresented in drug trials for heart failure, stable CAD, and acute coronary syndrome, and overrepresented in pulmonary hypertension clinical trials. Lastly, we, I will, will discuss lipid lowering therapies, randomized clinical trials. So Ken and colleagues examined 60 randomized control trials for lipid lowering therapies over an 18 year period. Surprisingly, the overall representation of women was less than 30%. And over the, um, over the study period, there was a modest increase from about 20% to about 34%. Women were more likely to be included in primary prevention versus secondary prevention trials. This term comes up again, prevalence to participation ratio. Women were underrepresented in drug trials favoring diabetes, heart failure, stable CAD, and acute coronary syndrome. And these are, this diseases present a significant burden for women in a clinical practice. They were overrepresented in hyperlipidemia trials. So what are the barriers and challenges to enrollment of women in clinical trials? I have um, divided, based on my review of literature, divided this into five factors. So we're going to look at patient factors, clinician factors, the research team factor, the study design factor, and systematic factors. So for the patient, considering clinical trial participation, there's problems, barriers that we face. The patient, some, most patients are not aware that there are opportunities for them to participate in clinical trials. They have a lack of trust of the system. And most most patients fall in that reproductive age and they have concerns about exposure to fetus, what, con what con um, contraception they'll have to undergo. Advanced age, comorbidities, willingness of female participants. And as we all know, women tend to, have, tend to be the caregivers for their families. Women's are, women are more likely to be widowed, so they themselves usually as they age, lack a caregiver. And often, more often than not, they have caregiver responsibilities, either towards their parents, their spouse, their children, and their grandchildren. All these are things that patients think about before they enroll in clinical trials. We should not underestimate the role of the clinician, especially the referring clinician. And for us as um, investigators on clinical trials, we rely on referrals from community cardiologists and primary pra practitioners. But putting yourself in the stead of the clinician, they, they have a heavy, um, a heavy clinic schedule, they're seeing patients, they're, all, they're, they're mostly concerned about their time constraints. We all know that women are likely they're less, less likely to be diagnosed with heart disease. So that pool of referral is not there. And women are less likely to be referred for clinical trials. The third factor is looking at study design. And we could spend the whole time here, but I'm just going to highlight a few things. 
women are likely to be underrepresented even in the study design. The inclusion and exclusion criteria tends not to favor women. The, some of the exclusion criteria exclude women of reproductive potential or women have to take additional contraceptives or barriers to get him pregnant in order to participate in the clinical trial. There are other inclusion and exclusion criteria such as age, biomarkers, GFR, BMI that are not sex um, friendly. Usually in clinical trials, most clinical trials or some clinical trials do not have a sex, spe sex specific pre um, specified outcome. And when you think about the woman as a caregiver, the frequency of study visits in the study design may limit their participation. Going to the research team, the clinical leadership from review of literature, clinical leadership and authorship of publications tend to be male dominated. There's underrepresentation of women on the study team and there's limited screening for, uh, for enrollment. Usually, sometimes you can find bias in the physician or even the coordinators. They have a bias against approaching female candidates. And often, often than not, you find lack of knowledge about spec sex specific barriers to participation. Finally, there are systematic issues that we have to think about. Access to clinical trials, where are the clinical practices located, awareness, public campaigns about the importance of enrolling in clinical trials, bias towards enrolling female, funding is a major barrier to enrolling women, and their lack of policies that support women as caregivers. Also, it is not surprising to this group that there's a lack of diversity of the biomedical research force. And I'll talk more about that when we talk about the minority population. So the same paper I, I, um, I highlighted earlier on by Pamela Scott and colleagues, this schematic shows the, partic the participation of women throughout the clinical trial pipeline. As you can see, even in the pre-screening process, they are le women, are, women are less likely to be pre-screened. And as you go down the pipeline, even to trial completion, less women are screened, less women are enrolled, and it stands to reason that less women complete clinical trials. So what are some strategies that we can think about to increase recruitment and enrollment of women? Go, just, uh, we're going to address it the same way we talked about those five factors, the patient, the clinician, the research team, the system, and the study design. I won't go through all of this, but some of the things I'll highlight are we need to have culturally tailored patient education tools to highlight the importance of study participation. In this age of digital technology, engaging women through social media, community organization, newsletters, going to women where they normally congregate is a strategy to improve patient participation. Of course, providing logistic support in terms of transportation and dependent care. Partnering with community cardiologists and primary care providers, maintaining that line of communication will enhance will increase patient recruitment and enrollment. Training your research team to recognize bias and to address bias as well as barriers to enrollment. In the study design as sponsors, we have a lot to think about. We have to make sure we were intentional about in, including women in the study design and clinical trial leadership team. We have to have pre-specified adequate powered recruitment target for female subgroup analysis. And it's on the study design team to minimize sex specific risks, especially regarding reproductive health. On, finally, on a systematic um, basis, has a system, has a body, has um, a research environment, we have to demonstrate that we are committed to women's health to, and in that way, we can build patient and community trust. 
ongoing campaigns to increase awareness of the importance of including women in research. And sponsors can consider increasing, providing incentives to sites to increase enrollment of women. Of course, funding to ensure that there is equal representation is very important. And training more women scientists and investigators by establishing formal mentorship program will grow the pipeline of investigators. We cannot forget systematic policies, governmental policies to support women as caregivers. So this is just an example of an outreach by the FDA encour encouraging women to enroll in clinical trials. So in the second half of my talk, I'm gonna turn my attention to underrepresented minorities in and their participation in cardiovascular clinical trials. We all know the excessive burden of cardiovascular disease in underrepresented minorities. This infographic is put out by the National Center for Health Statistics at the CDC. And what you can see here is, despite the fact that the age-adjusted mortality rates for cardiovascular disease is re has reduced over the past couple of years, blacks bear a significant burden of mortality for cardiovascular disease. This is self-reported prevalence among whites, among whites, Hispanics, and blacks. And there's, we do not rely much on self-related, um, on self-reported prevalence. But looking at this, for for whites, you've had a, an increase in the pre, a decrease in the prevalence of heart disease, while for other populations, there is a stable trend in the prevalence of heart disease. This group knows the risk factors for heart disease, and we all know the burden of risk factors such as hypertension, obesity, and diabetes. Blacks and Hispanics have bear a higher burden and have a higher prevalence. I will be remiss if I don't talk about the historical perspective of participation of underrepresented minorities in clinical trials. So going back, dating back to 1932, the infamous Tuskegee study. It was titled the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male. They enrolled about 600 black men, 399 with syphilis, and 201 who didn't have the disease. Interestingly, there was no informed consent. The initial time frame for the study was supposed to be six months, but it went on for 40 years until 1972 when there was a press article by the Associated Press highlighting the problems with this study. Even when penicillin became available in 1947, this was not offered to the participants by the investigators. And because of this, in 1972, the Office for Protection from Research Rates was established. Um, going down the pipeline, there were a lot of the congressional hearing, hearings, settlements, and in 1993, like I previously highlighted, this all led to the NIH Revitalization Act of 1993 that required the inclusion of women as well as ethnic minorities in clinical research studies. In 2006, the um, FDA became intentional about how to specifically report ethnic and racial data. And as you can see, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, as you include patients in your, tri in your clinical trials, you have to talk about the ethnicity, their ethnicity as well as their race. This slide shows enrollment in NIH sponsored trials by race. Actually, we got the slide from Dr. Anna, Hannah Valentine, who is the first chief officer for scientific workforce diversity at the NIH. She shared the slide at the Association for Preventive Cardiology Virtual Summit recently. As you can see, compared to other races, whites tend to be enrolled in NIH-sponsored clinical research. Although we see a trend that shows that 
black African Americans are now have an increased representation. Same trial, we had looked at this in this, actually in this study, they looked at both female and ethnic minorities. The abysmal thing about this trial is, is the representation of minorities. So overall, only 2.1% of blacks and 2.1% of Hispanics were represented in this cardiometabolic drug trial. And when you think about the high burden of cardiometabolic disease in ethnic minorities, this is not acceptable. And over the 10 year period, there was a trend but still less than 5% for Blacks and about 8% for Hispanics. Looking at heart failure trials, another paper put out by Dr. Tahan here, um, former fellow at Emory and now interventional cardiology fellow. They, they examined the, they looked at 119 heart failure trials over this time period. And what they found is that the participation of non-white. So it's important to notice that the, all, the, all, the, um, pop, all the other races were lumped as not white. Why was this so? Because they had a less than 5% really of blacks or Hispanics in this trial. So they had to lump them together. And even then you can see that the participation over the years is at an abysmal rate of about 30%. Looking at ACS trial, we all know the high burden of cardio, um, ca cardio coronary artery disease. You can also see the same trend. So whether we're talking about underrepresented minorities or female or women, they are, on they are less likely to be represented in clinical trials. This over the, um, over this, over the 17 year period, the, there was no significant trend in increase of participation of underrepresented minorities in ACS trials. So what are coming to talk, I think we should shift gears now and talk about barriers and, so, and solutions. What can we do? We have seen the magnitude of the problem. What can we do? So this paper was put out by Clark and colleagues and was basically talking about how to increase diversity in enrollment. And same, same barriers, whether you're an underrepresented minority or a female, there's a common thread here. So for pay, what they did was that they did a systematic literature review and they also interviewed stakeholders. So the stakeholders were the patients, minority investigators, referring clinicians, as well as clinical trial coordinators. As we all know, clinical trial coordinators are, are the backbone of a successful research enterprise. So the barriers that patients identified were, and this were minority patients, and these patients were patients who were either participating in cardiometabolic trials or had been approached and refused or were never approached. So it was a mix of patients. The major barriers were mistrust, lack of comfort with the process, lack of inf information, time and resource constraints, and lack of awareness. And they asked the patients, what do you think? What, what do you think would be a good solution to addressing these barriers? Um, the general themes they talked about was that they were concerned about their personal health and safety. They wanted clear information to be provided to them and also with ethnic minorities, they wanted to involve their family members, their significant order, others in the decision-making process. And that's where, where, why it's very important when you're giving informed consent, not to rush over, but give the patient ample time to discuss with their family, their friends, their significant order, because their participation in the clinical trial is some, most of the time is hinged on availability of their, their support system, provide clear information that is culturally sensitive, make the trials more patient centric. Don't think about the drug or the outcomes, but provide information, educational information for the patient. 
They also, I'm not, I, I just put this there here to highlight the importance of communication. So in doing those focus group and interviews, they highlighted some communication tips that were, that resonated with the, whether you were a patient or an investigator or a referring physician or even a clinical trial coordinator. And some of, some of the things that resonated with them that the patients wanted, they wanted their primary care provider to be involved in the process. So that's something we need to think about. For the referring physician, they sometimes the referring physicians feel as if they're not part of the team. So acknowledging their importance, keeping them in the loop was, some, was a, something that resonated when these people were interviewed. Talking about investigators, um, they, they interviewed also the investigators and their most part of mostly what they wanted that was important to them was kind of providing support for their patients to be in the trial. And study coordinators, we cannot under overemphasize the role of study coordinators. As a, um, as a principal investigator myself, I, I know the importance of um, study coordinators. So I acknowledge their roles, you know, and provide support and training to address their own biases and help them to become leaders also. One of the things we've talked about, and I know this might be addressed by some of the later speakers, is that there is a diminishing representation of women and underrepresented minority scientists. This slide also I got from Dr. Anna Valentine, um, Chief Officer for Diversity at the NIH. And looking at the slide, as you climb up the academic ladder, First of all, women in general are underrepresented. And when you look at underrepresented minority women investigators in the yellow bar, as you move up in the ladder, you can hardly find any other represented minority um, department chair. So I think that as a group, as a system, these are things that we need to target to improve enrollment of women as well as underrepresented minorities in clinical trials. So to put everything together, this schematic from the Office of Research of Women Health focuses on the main barriers to participation of women and minorities in clinical trials. So surprisingly, some people are never asked, patients are never asked about clinical trials. The fear and distrust of the research system from previous experience or history. Women tend to have work and family responsibility, caregiver responsibility. The expenses that are, that are, that are associated with the participating in the clinical trial, logistical issues, caregiver issues, transportation issues, and lack of knowledge generally about what the research process is. The complex consent process, and that's why it's very important for the consent process to be at the right literacy level as well as culturally competent. Um, doctors Ortega, Yancey, and Maron summarize strategies in their paper beautifully, strategies to increase diversity in enrollment in cardiovascular clinical trials. I'll highlight some of the strategies. So they talk about consideration given to economic incentives or penalties for failure to include appropriate representation of ethnic minorities as well as women in clinical trials. There must be a stakeholder commitment. So everybody involved in the research process, there must be a commitment to examine the trial design, the selection of investigators in site, and a geographical balance of participants in clinical trials. We have to engage with our international peer investigators to ensure race and ethnicity diversity and the gender balance. Also, I didn't talk about this, but looking at all the, um, in the drug trials, they looked at safety and efficacy of drugs, but there was no significant difference. So we have to explore enhanced 
cohort recruitment in both phase four and post approval studies to make sure we address the safety and implementation questions. It is of, of course very important to make sure that we're recruiting and we're training more diverse research coordinators and investigators team. Finally, they talk about the use of novel technology strategies. I think that we're moving towards a digital, we're in a digital age. So the use, the, prop, the adequate use of incorporating electronic health data, social media and other digital health technologies will enhance diversity in enrollment in clinical trials. Of course, we have to examine the informed consent process. Is it at an appropriate literacy level? Is it culturally sensitive? And finally, they talk about increasing societal awareness for research, what a term they describe as the research intelligence um, quotient. So all this can be achieved through community engagement and educational campaigns. This will take care, I will address the mistrust of the research enterprise and reduce barriers to participation. So finally, I want to leave you with some resource a resource that I came across as I prepared from this talk, Heart of the Press, just released in August by the Multi-Regional Clinical Trials Center. The guidance document titled Achieving Diversity and Inclus Inclusion and Equity in Clinical Research. Uh, this um, center is, is actually affiliated with Harvard University and the Brigham Women's and Women's Hospital. It's about almost a 400 page document. So please check it out. So in conclusion, diversity in clinical trial participation ensures adequate population representation that makes our research findings generalizable and it enhances translation of research findings to clinical practice, which is the ultimate goal of us as investigators. It allows us to examine sex specific and racial and ethnic differences. It allows us to test for the safety and efficacy of drugs, and it also promotes health equity. To address barriers to enrollment, a comprehensive targeted approach that involves partnership with all the stakeholders is essential. I want to leave you with this quote that I got from an organization. This organization is actually based here in Georgia, in Kennesaw, Georgia. It's an organization called Think Inclusive. They promote diversity and inclusion in the educational sector. So in this time and age where we are, where never before has diversity and inclusion been important, I leave you with this quote. Diversity and inclusion are about giving value to every human being, no matter our differences. Diversity makes us stronger. Thank you. for such a great talk. We've got a question here from Dr. Dansby. For overcoming fear and distrust in African-American populations, may it help to partner with HBCUs? Is this strategy being utilized? That is a very important qu question. I think that you raise a very important point. I think that utilizing uh, HBCUs, such as Mohawks, and um, Mehari and other HBCUs who already have a foundation or who have a relationship with African American communities will is very essential in um, in promoting diversity in clinical trials. I also put in a plug for the Association of Black Cardiologists, who uh, an organization that I'm part of, who has been a leader in promoting diversity in clinical trials. They have a signature program called Spirit of the Heart. And the last one we had in November 2019 brought together thought leaders from the community, faith leaders, government leaders, sponsors. And our topic was increasing awareness about participation in um, clinical trials. So that's a very good question. Thank you. Here's a second question. It seems like the negative stigma of the Tuskegee experiments lingers on. 
um, as a clinical scientist yourself. I'm wondering if you can share from your personal experiences what successful strategies you've employed to enroll either women or underrepresented minorities when discussing clinical trials, if they're initially resistant or have some concerns. So thank you for that question, Dr. Isiedin. So uh, my clinical practice is primarily based at Grady, where the patients we see are predominantly African-American. So when I approach a patient, I am, as a principal investigator, I am very, in, my coordinators can tell you, I'm very involved in enrolling patients in my clinical trial because first of all, I tell my patient, I'm your advocate. And if you go back to that document that I shared, they want to develop a trust and a relationship with whoever the principal investigator is. So I tell my patients, I'm your advocate. I'm not working for the sponsors. I'm not working for the government that's sponsoring this trial. I am here to make sure that to ad answer your questions, you can bring in your family members. Sometimes I have people bring in their family members and I'm never in a rush to consent a patient. So strategies that I've found that work is that having the, having the patient go home, discuss with their family members, and then giving them a call later to find out what do you think about it. The other thing that I've found that has worked, working in a system like Grady, where there are so many bottlenecks in achieving care. The patients that are enrolled in my trial have access to I have access to getting faster appointments. So I, what I do is that I, I make sure that they have enough, I take care of their personal healthcare needs. So for example, they need refills or they've been trying to get an appointment to podiatry or they've been trying to get an appointment to get a sleep study. I walk with them through patient, nav through patient navigators to ensure that their healthcare needs are primary and not the research um, needs, and that I found that's helpful. Excellent. Here is a, a great question from Dr. Mehta. Can you please comment on the role that a research coordinator can play, i.e. a patient may consider participating in a trial if their physician asks, but the research coordinator is not good or skilled at consenting, a patient can then decide not to participate. How do you overcome that barrier? I think that as part of what I talked about, there's need for ongoing training, ongoing training to help coordinators address the, their fears or their barriers or their bias towards approaching patients. So I think ongoing patients. And another thing I do is that if, I ha if I've noticed that a coordinator is reluctant to enroll a patient, I tell them, come, let me enroll, let me talk to this patient. And I talk to the patient, I say, I'm your heart doctor. We're doing this program to see whether we can improve survival, you know, things like that. And I have them watch me as a principal investigator. Like I mentioned, I'm very involved in my clinical trials. And I think that after they have observed you doing that, they may get that confidence to enroll patients. And of course, providing training to them also to address their bias. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Ogunui, for your talk. You've left us with a lot, of, uh, a lot to think about and some homework to do here. Uh, before we go to the break, Dr. Lumberg is going to give a presentation here. Yes, we want to say happy birthday to someone very, very important to us. Uh, very soon, Dr. Nanette Wenger is going to celebrate her 90th birthday. And we want to shout out to her. She is Professor Emeritus of Cardiology at Emory uh, University and the founding consultant of the Emory Women's Heart Center. But more important, she's a pioneer in heart disease in women and uh, just extraordinary to all of us. She's a leader with the American Heart Association and Go Red for Women. Just this year in 2020, she was awarded the Eugene Braunwald Academic Mentorship Award because she's not only a mentor to all of us with the Women's Heart Center at Emory, but she's literally a worldwide mentor to men and women. Uh, and she's received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Georgia ACC and in 2015, the ACC Bernadine Healy Award. She's published over 1600 papers and counting she is loved at Grady, Emory, and worldwide. Happy birthday, Danette, to, 20, to 90 years and many, many more. We love you.